Good morning. My name is Ron Shepard. I'm a member here at First Christian Church, and I've been asked to uh, lead a series of uh, Bible studies, virtual Bible studies, on the book of, um, of uh, Daniel. We'll be looking at the first six chapters of that book, focusing on Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But today's lesson is going to be an overview, kind of framing what took place in the study of Babylon. But first, again, I want to welcome you, and I want to say that we want to pray for you and help address any issues or concerns that you might have during this time, to pray for you or somebody in your family. I have here on the board our contact address. It's paul at firstchristianchurch.com. Paul at firstchristianchurch.com. Email him, and there'll be people praying for your concerns. Of course, we hope that you'll join us during this time for our worship, either 9 o'clock on YouTube or 11 o'clock on Facebook. During this time that we're 100% online, it's especially important that you understand the mission of the church continues. Church may have its doors temporarily closed, but the mission, the outreach, continues. So there's three ways you can continue to support the mission of the First Christian Church. One, just go to the website, firstchristianchurch.com. Click on the Give button, and then you'll have very simple instructions to follow. Two, you can give via text, firstchristianchurch.com, and you would go to 73256. Third, you can mail your tithes and offerings in to the church office. That way, you're laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So before we have this first virtual lesson on Babylon, let's pray. Lord, Dickens said in the book, The Tale of Two Cities, it is the best of times, it is the worst of times. For many throughout the world, in America, in Georgia, in Carroll County, Carrollton, it's the worst of times. But maybe with the proper attitude, with your oversight, with the leading of your Holy Spirit, this can be not the worst of times, but the best of times. So I pray that you would be with our attitude, that it be positive. And I would be amiss if I did not pray for all of our health care workers, technicians, doctors, nurses, analysts, that they be protected and be given a safety net as they try and deal with this virus. I pray for all those scientists throughout the world who are trying to find a vaccine that can help prevent this spread. Give them the kind of wisdom that does not come from colleges or grad schools, but the kind of wisdom that comes from you because you are the ultimate source of wisdom. I pray you would send that kind of wisdom to them to them even today that we might be able to move forward. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, my guess is you're asking, why study about the church in Babylon? So if I were to have a title, I would say the church in Babylon, light in darkness. So the question is, can the church be a light in a world of darkness? So as we study about the church in Babylon, Perhaps we can learn what it means for the church. And I'm talking now about you and me to be a beacon of light in a world of darkness. But before we attempt to answer that and other questions, we got to have some background. We got to have some way to frame this story. Why, why Babylon? So, some trivia. The word Babylon is listed 200 times in the Bible. Babylon in Hebrew is Babel, B-A-B-E-L. Some scholars believe where the Tower of Babel was built, it actually became the city of Babylon. The story of this tower is found in Genesis chapter 11, the first nine verses. The great flood is over. God told mankind, increase in number and fill the earth. Fill the earth. But the people decided to stay in one place and build this humongous tower that, and I quote, 
reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the earth. Thus, I think, they thought this tower would be a symbol of their power, but it's also a symbol of their disobedience to God. And in response, God confused their languages of humanity so that they could no longer communicate with one another. Hence the term Babel. Babel ceased to exist in 539 BC. It was conquered by the Medes and the Persians, led by the famous Persian king Cyrus the Great. We'll study more about him in one of the chapters later on. Today, believe it or not, Babylon is a UNESCO protected site 60 miles southwest of Baghdad. It was open to tourists in 2009. Now for you trivia buffs, during the second war in Iraq, the United States built a military base on the ruins of the ancient city of Babylon. When we left, it was reconstructed and hence opened in 2009 for tourists. Babylon became great under that great king Hammurabi, famous for his code of ethics, which contained 282 laws that governed Babylonian society, and the famous Hanging Gardens, which became one of the ancient wonders of the ancient world, one of the seven wonders. If you have a map in the back of your, of your Bible, Babylon is located on both sides of the Euphrates River with three separate walls, each 40 feet high, manned by towers throughout. And the walls were wide enough that three or four horse-drawn chariots could race simultaneously. In terms of square miles, it's about the size of Chicago. What did the Babylonians speak? Well, they spoke a semantic language which today would most likely be a combination of Arabic and Hebrew. Now, the Babylonians worshiped many gods, plural gods, one of whom was Marduk. He was the chief. Sometimes he was called Bel, B-E-L. This god, Marduk, presided over justice, compassion, healing, regeneration, magic, and fairness. He also was the god of thunderstorms and agriculture. Now, don't let that agriculture pass you by. Because they believed he was the god of agriculture, crops, they believed in fertility rituals, fertility rites. Today, we would say sexual orgies. Now, this is the city into which the Jews will be taken captive. This Marduk, by the way, had 50 different names. The Greeks called him Zeus. The Romans called him Jupiter. OK, Ron. Okay, but again, why study about this city? Well, this city is going to receive thousands and thousands of Jewish exiles taken from Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside in Judea. They're going to live there for 70 years, as the prophet Jeremiah predicted. Can these Jews keep their religious values, their beliefs, their customs, their practices, their religion, in a nation that practice plural gods, that practice cult worship. Can you worship your God, our God, in a hostile society? Modern terminology, can a church exist in a Babylon? See, the Jews were monotheistic. They worshiped the one true God. They called him Jehovah, or in Hebrew, Yahweh, or maybe you've heard him called Adonai, or Elohim, or El Shaddai. But the Babylonians were pluralistic, okay? They had at least five different gods and goddesses, some male and some female. And each god or goddess had their own temples, or what they called ziggurat. Google ziggurat, Z-I-G-G, U-R-A-T, and you'll see kind of a triangle temple. And these were spaced throughout the city of Babylon. 
So here you have the Jews being captive, worshiping God in this kind of a strange, hostile society. So I want you to, I want you to come with me and walk the streets of Babylon. Let's pretend we're Jewish, okay? We're going to the marketplace, maybe to buy some things, or maybe we've got some groceries to sell. But as we're walking down the streets of Babylon, on every street corner is one of these cult temples. And there's priests and priestess, and they're doing all kinds of rituals and song and singing. And maybe we even see some temple prostitutes. But we're seeing things that violate our belief and our religion. And I wonder what those Jewish people must have thought. I wonder what they must have felt when they went back home and they went to their synagogue and they prayed and worshiped Jehovah, having witnessed this kind of secular problem. So let's find out why and how the Jews from Jerusalem are going to be taken to Babylon. The prophet Jeremiah tells us, Jeremiah, who is he? Well, I'm glad you asked. Okay? He's a priest from the village of Nata, A-N-A-T-A. -A -A. That's about three miles from Jerusalem. His father was a priest. So I guess you could say Jeremiah was a preacher's kid. He's going to be called the weeping prophet because he's always warning about the oncoming destruction of Judah and Jerusalem and the hostages being taken to Babylon. And so Je Jeremiah is constantly being slandered, misunderstood. He was even arrested, thrown into a pit, and put into stocks. And one time he was ran out of town. No wonder he's called the weeping prophet. Question, have you ever been slandered? for your faith, misunderstood for your faith, arrested for your faith? Have you ever been ridiculed, the victim of sarcasm, because you took a stand for Christ, his Bible, his church? Well, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, and I have several of uh, Jeremiah's scriptures here. I hope you can see that. I have to print. I'm a terrible writer, so I print. But I'd like to start off by reading just a little bit from Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Paraphrase. God tells this to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I saw you in your mother's womb, and I set you apart to be my prophet to the nations. God will commission Jeremiah before he's even born to tell the people what God expects from them and what he will do for them and that he has planned for their future, both good and bad, as we'll find out. Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, connects with that bad. God is angry at the people's disobedience. God says, you have rejected me. You've become wicked in my sight. You have burned incense to other gods. You worship other gods' idols, which you made with your own hands. Question, is it possible today? Let's move to right now. Is it possible today for you and me to make idols? What do you mean, Ron? Okay, how about your job? Do you worship your career? Do you worship your status? Are you a very important person? What about your bank account, your savings account? I would mention your 401k in the stock market, but that's, forget I said that, okay, right now. But the whole point is, is it possible that maybe we worship our home, all the stuff in our home, our status? You know, God was upset with them because they worshiped idols. Today, is it possible that we might be doing the same? In that same chapter, God is going to refer to himself as the fresh, living, pure water. He's fresh, living, pure water. He, he gives them energy. He revitalizes them. But he says, you have chosen polluted water like water found in a cistern. Sister. So I'd like for you to think of, of uh, well, I'd like, I'd like for you to come with me to my home and temple. Outside my shed, I have a rain barrel. I put out there years ago to collect water, so in July and August I'd have something to water my plants. I wasn't smart enough to cover them. 
And I'd go out there and I would find pine straw and sticks. And in March, April, and May, pollen. And one day I went out and I found a dead squirrel. He had apparently jumped off the roof and had drowned. It was at that point I put a lid on it. But the thought is, can you imagine drinking water that's full of sticks and bugs and mosquito and pollen versus fresh living water? That's exactly what God told Jeremiah to tell them. You're drinking this polluted stuff when I'm offering you fresh living water. They chose bad over the good. So come with me to Jeremiah chapter 6, and I hope you're sitting down. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 16. It goes like this. God is so upset with his people, his people, the people of the covenant, the people of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, so upset, here's what he said. Jeremiah, do not pray for these people. Do not pray for these people, nor offer any plea or petition for them. Do not plead with me for them, for I will not listen. Time out. Aren't we taught to pray? Sunday school, life group, mission work, church. God is saying to Jeremiah, these people have so betrayed me and turned away from me. Do not pray for them, for I will not listen. He goes on. Do you not see what they're doing in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of David, the city that has the temple, the key place of worshiping. I am angry. He's so angry with his disobedience. But you know what? I think he's probably angry with us today when we disobey. I don't think he wants lip service. I don't think he wants nominal service. I think he wants total obedience. He wanted it then from the Jews in Jerusalem. He wants it today from us Christians. God wants obedience in love. So, as a result, Jerusalem is going to be conquered. Captives will be taken back. Now, from Jerusalem to Babylon. If you've got a good map in the back of your Bible, check it out. But from Jerusalem to Babylon is about 800 miles. Now, if you think a person could walk 20 miles uh, in the desert a day, then that 800-mile trip would take 40 days. Now, if that's so, for many people, this is a death march. They're not going to make it to Babylon. They're going to die along the way. Families are broken up. Homes are broken up. Neighborhoods are broken up. People have left their jobs. They've left their family. They've left their loved ones. What if that were to happen to us? Think what you'd be leaving. You'd be leaving your family and your friends, all those things that you're familiar with. You'd be leaving your church, your Sunday school, your life group. When my wife and I moved down from Indiana 20 years ago, it was a little bit of a cultural shock. Um, as Hoosiers, we had to learn that we're fixing to do this and fixing to do that. I quickly learned to like grits, fell in love with the sweet pork barbecue. Unbelievable. But there's some, some, some things that I missed. I missed our favorite restaurants in Frankfurt and Indianapolis. And coming from Big Ten country, we missed Big Ten basketball. Couldn't get it down here, just the SEC. But you know what? My favorite restaurants and Big Ten basketball pales, pales in comparison to what these people had to give up and what they had to miss. They give up everything, and for some, their lives. Much of Jerusalem will be destroyed. The artifacts in the temple taken back to Babylon. In Jeremiah chapter 6, verses 22 to 30, here's what Jeremiah warns the people, having been told by God. Look, look, an army is coming from the land of the north, Babylon. A great nation is being stirred up from the ends of the earth. They are armed with bow and spear. They are cruel and they show no mercy. They sound like the roaring sea. Come with me to Destin, Florida. Come with me to the beaches on the Atlantic. If you've ever walked along those beaches, and the clouds are rolling in, and it's getting dark, and the sea is getting 
bigger and the waves are coming in. You can imagine the sound and the waves getting bigger and bigger may have even pulled you under. I think that Jeremiah is saying they're going to come like the roar of a sounding sea. But he also says they're going to make the sound of horses, men on horses. They come like men in a battle formation to attack you, O daughter of Zion. We have heard reports about them, and our hands have gone limp. Our hands have gone limp. Anguish has gripped us. Pain like that of a woman in labor. Don't go out into the fields or walk on the roads, for the enemy has a sword, and there is terror on every side. Put on sackcloth, people, and roll in ashes. Mourn with bitter wailing as for an only son. I think the reference there is your only son has died. And Jewish custom was to wail, to hire professional mourners, to hire musicians to come into the house and play and cry and wail. I think Jeremiah is saying we're in for it. For suddenly the destroyer will come upon us. And indeed he did. 598 B.C. and again in 587 B.C. But... But, there's my little smiley face. I hope you can see it. It's Jeremiah 29, verses 4 to 13. Jeremiah 29, 4 to 13. There is a promise, a good one, that God has. And here's what he says. God says to the exiles in Babylon, settle down, plant gardens, eat the produce from your gardens, marry and have sons and daughters in marriage, Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Now get this next part. This is God, not Ron. Okay? Also, seek the peace and prosperity of that city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if Babylon prospers so too will you. I don't think God is saying you'll make money. You'll be rich and famous. I think he's saying there'll be peace. There'll be peace. There'll be an absence of war, an absence of tension, an absence of conflict. And yeah, there may be some money involved. The Jewish people may prosper in their gardens, in their businesses. But I think what God is saying is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you there 70 years. I'm going to bring you back. That's my promise. In the meantime, pray. And one of the things I want us to do in this series, starting next week with Daniel chapter 1, I want us to take a look at Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the pressure that they were under and how they dealt with this through prayer, through prayer. Praying, praying for the very kings who had the power to kill them and who indeed Tried to kill them. God is saying, pray for them. Okay? In 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. Okay? He says, I know I have plans for you. Plans to prosper you. Not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then, then, you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I'll be found, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. When God makes a promise, he'll fulfill it. Take God's promise to the bank. Deposit it. Recession, inflation, the virus, the stock market crash cannot affect in any way his promises to us. If we seek him, we have his assurance he's waiting. Well, how do you know, Ron? Christmas, Christmas. He fulfilled his promise with the Christ child. It continued on the cross, the empty tomb, his resurrection, and his promise to return. That's his assurance. So, what's going to happen to these captives? as they're led off into a strange land, a strange city, strange religion, language, culture. 
Have you ever had the fortune to travel overseas for an extended period of time? My wife and I were very, very fortunate. We reared two boys from Thailand. So we had to study about Thai culture, Buddhism, Thai food. We've been very fortunate to go and visit them on several occasions. It's a totally different world. So one of the things the two boys wanted to take, two men now, they wanted to take us to Buddhist shrines. Okay, we quickly learned, if you have on Bermuda shorts, you cannot go into a Buddhist temple. Okay, so now we're wearing long pants. So now we have on long pants the next day. We go into this big, huge shrine where there's a big golden Buddha. We are told, take your shoes off. Okay, sit on the floor. Okay, but point your knees away from Buddha. Not allowed to point your toes toward the Buddha. That's disrespect. So here I am sitting with my feet to the right so I won't offend the Buddha. And the food. I'm sure that if you've traveled in foreign countries, you've tasted the food. Perhaps you've had to have an interpreter to say, this is good, this is good. Don't go there. For us, it was the Thai peppers. I wanted to experience a hot Thai pepper. So one of our boys said, try this. And instead of giving me water, gave me a big piece of bread because he said, this is hot. Now, he chewed those peppers like we chew gum. So I put that pepper in my mouth, and within 10 seconds, I had sweat pouring off my forehead, down my back. I am soaked. I am eating bread like it's the last loaf in Bangkok. That may just be something small that those Jewish people had to experience with the, with the variety of, of cultural traits. So, they're in exile. They're going to do everything they can to maintain their Jewish beliefs. So we're going to close today's opening lesson with this question. Can, there, can they survive in Babylon? Can the church be a light in a Babylon? We're going to attempt to unpack that over the next six lessons. And we're going to try and learn something from our four amigos, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's going to be a character study. But I want to ask you this question. As we study, ask yourself this question. Can the church in America exist in a Babylon? Can first Christian church exist in a Babylon? And let's get really personal as we end. Can you and I, the koinonia, the called out ones, can we be the church in Babylon? Let's pray. God, give us strength, discernment, wisdom to know what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and why to do it. Empower us through your Holy Spirit. Bless our study together, even though it's virtual, even though we're isolated, we can still connect. So bless our study. Through your spirit is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Hope to see you next week. God bless.